Low ticket's huge for us right now. We're running all these low ticket offers to help you know get people in the ecosystem because I want them on my list as buyers. A lot of people run like free webinars, free trainings, like that stuff is cool. But if you also supplement both ways, like you're gonna have buyers who come into the ecosystem and free people, and those free people can now buy something small and then they can move up the actual ladder. Wanted to be able to give people some type of small tease of what was good and what could work so that it would be easier for them to say, hey, like I bought this small priced item. Now I can trust him if I wanna buy a high ticket from him. Jason Wojo here, nine figure marketer and paid advertiser. And you are listening to the Seven Figure Squad podcast. So my guest today is Jason Wojo, and uh, he is a 26-year-old multimillionaire. He's generated over $100 million online, been featured on Fox, all the business channels. And I'm, I'm not going to even try to attempt saying his last name properly. So with that being said, welcome to the Seven Figures One podcast, Jason Wojo. Thanks, man. I'm glad you're here, man. Thanks for it, flying man. in. Thanks for having me. So with that being said, please share your full pronunciation of your last name. So It's Wojo Howitz. It's Polish. It doesn't even use half the letters. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Chicago, where we're originally from, a lot of all three of us, there. a lot of Polish. I think it's the number one uh, immigrant Polish community in the world. Yeah. So, so, so Chicago. So, uh, so Jason, we're we're talking uh, a little bit here offline. So, uh, talk to us. How about you got you got you got started from culinary school to Pokemon cards? Tell us the story. How about how you got involved in your yeah. world today? So, I was working at a cafe when I was about 15, 16 years old, um, making five bucks an hour cash under the table. And I didn't know anything else but like flipping eggs and making breakfast food. So my boss at the time was like, hey, you should go to culinary school. You don't know what else you want to do, which I didn't. I had no clue what I wanted to do. I didn't know about the internet. I didn't know about marketing. I didn't know about business. I had no idea. How old were you then? 16. Wow. 17 okay. Yeah. So I wound up going up to culinary school. Uh, I realized that it was not for me at all. I, didn't, I wound up not going to classes at all. I was just playing Mario Kart in my dorm room. And one day it was snowing really heavily in upstate New York grabbed my snow shovel, was getting stuff out of my car, and I found in the trunk Pokemon cards. And I was like, all right, well, you know what? I'm playing Mario Kart. This is kind of congruent, so I might as well go upstairs with it. So I took it upstairs, and I was on eBay, and I was just seeing all the values of these cards. Mm -hmm. And I started selling some. I got, like, three, four sales a day. It was, like, this, like, dopamine effect. And I was like, huh, maybe I should just, like, run a business. Like, cooking sucks. <laughs> so I wind up dropping out, moving back in with my parents, went to business school then. And I was doing that on the side. And then that's when I found Ty Lopez's course. Cause I was in, in my garage with my Lambo. Yeah. <laughs> I found that I spent nine ninety seven on that course, which was a lot of money to me back then. A thousand, like a bucks. thousand bucks. I was like, you know, I was only making like $800 a month. So like, that was a lot. Uh, but what made you want to invest a thousand bucks and you're making 800 bucks a month? Cause a lot of people, they don't know how to invest in themselves. Yeah. I think it's more about betting on yourself than anything. Like I had more confidence in myself than a job. That's for sure. Every, every, even at 18 years old, even at 19? Every job I had, I got fired from. <laughs> like, every job I had. I got fired from Staples because I was in the back, like, where all the boxes were. And I would, like, I would hide in the boxes and I would scare the employees. Like, they <laughs> in the back, dude, it was so funny. Uh, I have so many clips of that, too. It's funny. But Would there be prank videos today? Yeah. Oh, dude, sure. so good. <laughs> um, but, dude, like, yeah, just betting on myself. Like, I figured if I'm going to bet on anything, it's not going to be school. It's not going to be anything else. It's going to be myself. Um, and then I took the course, started working with local businesses. And then my dad basically forced me to move out because I couldn't afford the rent with him. So I wound up moving to Orlando and then I started my journey. Who'd you know in Orlando? Nobody. I literally went on Facebook marketplace. I found the room <laughs> in the house. I messaged him and Steve it at the time. He's like, all right, FaceTime me. So you're not like a creep. So I FaceTime him. And then he's like, okay, like, you know, when do you want to move? I'm like tomorrow. He's like, bro, the room's not ready. I'm like, I don't care. I'll sleep on the floor until the bed frame and stuff is there. So I wound up waking up at 3 a.m. the next morning, and I drove to Orlando, and I started my life, and that was it. Wow. And I've been in Florida ever since. No, Orlando, no kidding. We have, we have John Mason out there, Altamont, yeah. Altamont Springs. So, R Rudy, uh, you've helped me market myself since 2006, 2007. Mm -hmm. Remember my personal brand, MatthewSapolaInc.com. Yeah, that was and, fun. <laughs> you know, and I spent like 20 grand. I spent 20 grand on, on a digital, not a digital advertising, just an advertising agency. Yeah. Uh, Peter Montoya. I spent 20 grand, I spent $25,000 with him. Website, brochure, folders, business card, template, uh, yeah, letterhead. Like a branding package. Branding right? package. Marketing package. And then, and then I did dinner seminars, well, Joe. So I, I was doing dinner seminars. I'd mail out 5,000 pieces of mail to hopefully get a 1% response. So 50% of pe 50, 50 people would show up out of 5,000. To me, that was, that was a win. So in other words, 4,950 people mm -hmm. 
either chuck it or, or not even show up. To me, that was expensive, you know, direct mail. And so that was dinner seminars. So we, we've evolved now into this level of, okay, maybe then social media and then online. So, you know, that's my big intention in having you here because this is like the new school of, 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 of understanding stuff. So, you know, my, my biggest competition is not guys in their 40s and 50s. My biggest competition or biggest complimenters are guys in their 20s. You know, and so, uh, so I've hired, so you, you guys know, I've hired Jason to help us out with our digital marketing and advertising. So what, what's some of the things, so what's some of the perspectives, Rudy, that, that you may bring to this? Because I don't understand this world. I don't understand the, the marketing and advertising world. Sure. So what's some of the dots we've been connecting here with Jason since working together with him? Yeah, well, I think you hit some things in the head, Matt, which is, you know, the market has evolved, the way that people consume information has evolved, and the way that they interact with that. Yeah has also evolved. And while some things have still stayed the same, for example, the value is in the database and the relationship that you have with that database, yeah. right? So the name of the game here is let's build a database, but let's cultivate a solid relationship with those people. Yeah. And we can move them down, you know, into more intimate stuff, which is what Jason does extremely well. Yeah. I'm so excited that we're working with him because yeah. he's really figured this stuff out. And so, uh, but it's funny you mentioned, you know, uh, the 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 people chuck in the mail and man that was crazy dude yeah, we still have a little PTSD from that uh, and I think some of us still have the the folders I think my wife has a box thank you. full of folders thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah somewhere you know we give them away to people like here take that you know? yeah because because Jason my my seminar I I I ordered five thousand folders so when people come in they have a folder blah 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 people think we shit about the folder yeah, <laughs> like they don't care about none of that stuff so. Can you tell us what a lot of entrepreneurs get wrong in terms of marketing and branding themselves? Yeah. So first thing I see is that people overthink the market. They think that they need to be a perfectionist with like the branding and the logos and all these things. And it's like that kind of faded out because I think that people really just care about two things. Well, w when they buy something, they really care about two things. One is results and two is access. I feel like those are the two most important things that people really care about. The branding and all of that comes after you actually have cash flow and money. Access to you, the, the yeah, expert. Yeah, access to the expert, access to the results, just access to like the emotion in general. Because regardless of us as marketers and business owners, we look at business like numbers, right? Conversion rates, you know, how many people show up, close rates, right? But people who are your consumers mostly make emotional choices. Yeah. And it's this like boundary that sometimes it's hard for us to cross over to each. Right, because we have to understand them, and they need to understand our product more. Because they're emotional, we're number based. So that's where most entrepreneurs mess it up: is that they just think so emotionally about their website, how it looks, the branding, all this. And I'm like, you need to focus on your offer. Like, how do you make this thing so irresistible that people will buy in a heartbeat? And two is your actual like copy, like your your storytelling, like writing words that sell regardless if it's on a post or a landing page or a website or a webinar or a VSL, whatever it is, if you can't write words that sell, no one's going to care about your message in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's the way people initially connect with you. Right. Yeah. So if those words don't resonate with them, then they're going to check out. They're yeah. Storytelling is huge. So I got his product. So I got a conference call with him when he was selling me and coming on board. He, uh, I was like, how do I come across your list? Like how do I, how do I even interact with you guys? I was doing some Google search, oh, email search, and I bought a, I think a $47 product yeah, yeah. On, on, on hooks, how to start off my video. Yeah, yeah. so that, like low ticket's huge for us right now. We're running all these low ticket offers to help, you know, get people in the ecosystem because I want them on my list as buyers. A lot of people run like free webinars, free trainings, like that stuff is cool. But if you also supplement both ways, like you're going to have buyers who come into the ecosystem and free people. And those free people can now buy something small and then they can move up the actual ladder. Yeah. So both ways work. I just wanted to be able to give people some type of small tease of what was good and what could work so that they would, it would be easier for them to say, Hey, like I bought this small sure. priced item. Now I can trust him if I want to buy a high ticket from him. Exactly. That's, that's, the, that's the principle there because even in financial services, you get somebody a policy you know, you know, they're gonna stick around. Yeah. But you get two policies or three different accounts, four different policies, get the whole family. The more involvement you got with the, 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 the client, the more they're likely to stick around than like what you just said. Like that's why a lot of guys like selling term insurance because exactly. it's a very easy, cheap product to, to obtain. That's true. Yeah. 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 And then also Sticky like, sugar. you know, getting them on your list and sending them value, like having them drive to your YouTube channel, having them drive to other channels. 
Like there's this one email that crushes for us and it is sending them to a YouTube video where I literally recorded myself for four weeks straight taking an e-com brand from zero to 152K in like 28 days. And when people watch that video, they hop on the sales call, they have their car down ready to rock. That's like our best performing email. Every time someone clicks that email and watches that YouTube video, it's game over. We should do it's a crazy. video on how to take someone from zero to $100,000 in income. 100%, yeah, in, you got a few of the stories like that. So you're saying that's a more results yeah. in advanced case study type situation. Yeah, yeah. and like you're giving really them this, this vision of like, hey, here's what your situation could look like. Like obviously results may vary, but like here's what we were able to do with this person and likelihood is we could do it with you too if you're willing to stick sure. the path. So, so Mil Milton here is my trainer, and, and uh, when I met him, he was working at a UFC gym. And then COVID came, like four months later, five months later. Was it five months later? Five, five six months later, five, six yeah. Five, six months later, COVID hit, and you were forced to go offline and, and start your own business. You know, so, so the pandemic got you. So he's also creating some courses online in terms of his online fitness. Yeah. Um, what's some of the thoughts you have here in terms of di digital advertising, online, online marketing? I think, I think for me, the pe like people in my world, a service-based business, um, when I, again, with, with what was going on with you, I was able to leverage that. You know, we took his health from point A to point B. We fixed things that he needed to be, that needed to be fixed. And all of a sudden, a lot of things in his life started changing. So I utilized that as a case study. So that's, as you said, you know, you got low ticket offers. In the beginning, when I started pumping out a lot of uh, case studies, and the main case study was him, and people in in his industry, not just the company, but his industry, and that case study, people were clicking. You know, like, you know, uh, you know, uh, X Y X Y Z X Y Z. Drop the comment below. I don't know, uh, entrepreneur or next level, or whatever. And then my email started getting pumped with a lot of people saying, "Hey, I want that case study. I want that case study." And that easily, immediately when they start started seeing what we did for Matt for the next two three years, that started converting converting very, very heavily. So now I'm walking into the whole ideology of having a landing page, having a VSL, because my, my avatar are entrepreneurs. That's my avatar. Helping them get become high-performing human beings so that way they can perform better in any industry that they may be in. So my thing for my question is for, for you, since we know, again, it's a very, a very value-driven approach, you know, how much value can you add to me and how much trust can we build over time with that? Knowing that the algorithm is consistently changing in, in your world, from what you've seen working with various groups of people from different demographics, um, what are some strategies that, you know, that you've been able to implement to, regardless of what avatar it may be, to be able to adapt to the constant shift in the algorithm on social media? So as far as algorithms are concerned, um, more so I look at the most important part of any business, which is the offer first. Right. If I know what your offer is, regardless of economy or the niche or how algorithms move, if we can just tweak the wording or make it more irresistible or have differentiation against what other people are running, then ultimately you're going to get results a lot faster and it's going to be better quality control on your end for all the leads that you're getting. OK, so don't always focus on algorithms because here's the thing, right? We've seen algorithms on organic. We've seen it on even on on, on ads. But realistically, they don't exist if you're willing to do two things. Number one is study the market and be like a visionary of it. And number two is if you're just willing to spend a little bit extra to outbeat your, your competition. Because there's people out there who try to get, you know, a lot for so little. And I'm like, hey, well, that's not really how the ad platforms work. You know, you could run multiple traffic sources, but at the end of the day, if your offer is better, you're gonna get better cost per clicks. If your offer is better, you're gonna get better CTRs. If your offer is better, your landing page have a higher conversion rate where you don't have to then spend as much. You can have a higher conversion rate. So that's where I see the, to really answer your question is, if your offer is really, really sexy, none of those things matter. Here's one of the things that I, that I notice amongst a lot of people, especially people in my world, I'm not sure about you guys, and I'm sure you've, you've seen this a lot. People can create a, an amazing offer, an irresistible offer, a grand slam offer, a, an offer that if, you, if people feel stupid saying no to, that, one of those offers. But the thing is, there's no fulfillment. A lot of people can create a, such a sexy offer, package it very well, wrap, wrap it around really well, but now when it's time to execute and actually fulfill it, it's empty. So I think that also starts breaking down the trust and your brand and your name starts getting intense because you can't fulfill on what you offer. A lot of people over, over promise and under deliver on all the offers. And it's usually because they want to take on all the fulfillment possible yeah. because they just want to make more money. Yeah. But them as the leader in the business, they can't like take that leadership role and hire the right A players around them. Like they're not attracting the right people. So they might hire people for less because they want to cut costs. 
And those people aren't trained well. Those people are not A players. And also that business owner is so busy taking on all these clients, making money that they don't want to put the time into the people who need to be trained to become A players. So it's like, that's where I see a lot of lack of fulfillment in our industry by far is just that people don't have the right personnel. They don't have the right team. They don't have the right systems and they don't have the right person watching over it. So, see, see what I'm saying? And I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up with this for, for my, for that specific question. A lot of people get stretched out so thin because they're trying to wear di different hats, especially when, they, when you're first starting off. You're the setter, you're the salesperson, you're, you're the marketer, you're the one creating the videos, the, creating the looms, the instructionals, the VSLs, <laughs> all that stuff. You're that guy. At, Depend, based off on what you've experienced, at what point, whether it's financial, whether it's uh, revenue, whatever the case may be, right? At what point do you suggest someone finally hire the first setter or hire the first salesperson? I think it comes down to the 80-20 rule where it's like 20% of the things that you're doing produce 80% of the results. And when you feel like that balance is not there, mm -hmm. where you feel like you're kind of creeping into the 50-50 range, that's where you got to hire somebody. Like as the leader and the business owner, you should only be doing 20% that produces 80% of the results. Right. And then what you do is, is you have other people around you who help you with that 20 percent. And then you become this visionary. Yeah. And the visionary is the person who is that leader around to the whole entire team and builds the environment and whatnot. And like visionary, as far as, for example, when I was running the agency, once I hit about 50 K a month, I was like, ah, like I'm tired. Like I can't do all this, you know, and I wasn't able to focus on content and going to events and doing all these things. And then once I was able to hire a good team around me, now I can fly around and go on podcasts and like host my own events and like do things that are me being the visionary for the entire company. How'd you let go of that control? A lot of people have this sense of wanting to control the entire thing, the entire outcome that people are scared to give people that power to delegation, delegate them to do X, Y, Z Do it myself. Yeah, that exactly. type of mentality. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I had a massive control issue when I was first getting started because I was like, oh, like no one's better than me. No one knows this better than me. No one knows how to talk to the clients as good as me. But I was like, you know what? If I find someone who's at least 80% as good as I am, then maybe I should just like sit back. Mm -hmm. Also, the thing that let me get out of my control was just honestly having a little bit of cash saved so that if things ever went south, like maybe I'd lose 20K for a month and like have to go hire someone else. And that wouldn't hurt me that much. Mm -hmm. Like it was having the reserve to be like, okay, like if this goes south, at least I'm okay. That was my thing. I wasn't, I wasn't going to let it hurt my ego. I'd rather let it hurt my wallet than my ego. Like, cause money is used to solve problems. I'd rather just let someone take a little bit of it and let me learn a lesson. Yeah. Just talk, talk to, I'm sorry. Uh, well, I was just going to, uh, you know, ask this cause you made a great point, right? Which is how do I let go of control? What I've noticed is a lot of people, when they start building a business, they're either stuck on uh, employee mindset. So, so you're trying to run a business like an employee or you're trying to run a business like a self-employed person. That's the guy that says, I could do this myself. You just don't do this enough. So I'm just going to take it. But now you just robbed yourself of the leverage and the freedom to do that. So how, how much would you say is people being aware of that mindset and being able to shift from employee and self-employed to the business owner. So the thing that I've seen is that people are only going to be aware if they suffer some type of trauma around it. So like no one's going <laughs> to learn. No one's going to learn unless they actually have a bad experience yeah. because if it goes well or it's in this complacency stage, then they're okay with it. They're like, oh, like nothing bad happened. I'm chilling. Right. So good. But until something bad happens, that's when they're like, oh, oh, like maybe they got a big charge back from a client they shouldn't have, or maybe they suffered something like, uh, you know, a refund request or something that like really traumatized them. That's the only way that they're going to actually learn. We, we get a lot of that from recruiting into the insurance industry. Yeah. People had a family member pass away without life insurance or they lost a lot of money during the recession. Yep. Right. You know, 401k became 201k and they come into this insurance industry and say, where were you five years ago? Where were you when I had the worst moments in my life happen? So what would you, my, my question, I'm going to go back because it sounds great. But this is awesome. You get into it. But I want to go to the, uh, the the brand new Wojo pitching new clients. You have no track record. You're, the, you don't have uh, uh, clients that can say something. You don't have a team. So talk to us about what your initial steps were to starting your business. So the biggest things for me was if I'm going to be able to build this thing around my ideas and like my methodology, then I really have to put it down on paper. Right. So like. When I was doing stuff throughout the day and I was writing copy and building offers, like I would put stuff in a Google Doc and like, this is how I think, this is how I write headlines, this is how I do all this. And that's what I use as like SOPs. A lot of people are so busy running the business that they don't think about these things at all. They just think that they're going to run the business forever by themselves because 
to be honest, you will retain a higher profit margin if you're on your own. And that's where people get stuck in that. They're like, okay, like maybe they're making 100K a month, right? And they're keeping 80 because they're a solopreneur. Well, why not try to go for half a mil a month and maybe you don't have high profit margins, but you get to build like more around you. you that's what, yeah. Freedom. Yeah, that's what I cared about more. I was like, hey, like money aside, like I want to be a part of something bigger. So I decided to build the SOPs and like that was one of my main focuses. I was like, hey, like at some point I'm going to get burnout. Yep. Who did, you, who did you pitch? Who was your initial customers? Were they restaurants? Were they service-based business? Yeah, they were like high ticket services. So like anything where if they got a sale, it was at least over a thousand bucks. So it's like cabinet coating, solar, roofing, um, home renovation, mortgage lenders. Um, geez, the, the list goes on. Like anything that was high ticket enough to where I would just get them like, if I could just get them three to five customers a month, they would stay. Like that was, that was the whole play. Because if I was working with like, you know, a, a restaurant yeah. selling a $3, like, you know, empanada. I can't really, like, there's only so many empanadas that I can sell. Yeah, or you know? a startup e-com, right? Where they're, yeah, yeah. You know, like, those bucks. are a lot tougher, too, because yeah. those business owners don't understand the startup capital. They don't understand that they have to put money into the business. They just think that they saw an ad for a dropshipping course, and all of a sudden, now they want to make money. And it's like, see, that's where, like, all the marketing stuff that we see in our niche is kind of a gift and a curse. It's like direct response is cool, but some people ruin it for the rest of us. Yeah. Like they give these false promises and someday the FTC is going to go after them and I can't wait for that. But like, it's like yeah. all these things, man. It's crazy. Yeah. A, a friend of mine asked me, hey, Matt, you can you put $50,000 on your credit card each month? I'm like, yeah, why? This is great. You can, you can drain a, you can generate another $50,000 in revenue if you advertise on Amazon, own, a, own an e-com store. So what happens if I don't advertise? So then you don't sell anything. <laughs> So, so then th just in that one pitch alone, I learned, oh, that's why certain things are floating at the top of the uh, search bar when yeah, I search for, they're pay they're paying for it. Yeah. iPhone charger because they're paying for it. I get it. I get it. I, so I understood it. Uh, so so I, I want to know, though, I, I'm still curious though, about your pitch. Well, if, if, um, if I'm a mortgage lender, mm -hmm. you pitch me, what would you tell me? Um, oh, geez, put me on the spot. Come on. Uh, <laughs> if, I was, if I was pitching anybody, it would be like, hey, if you're a business owner who has made money organically for the longest time, I hope you realize that if it's organic, that can be cut at any moment. Like you're never gonna have a backup of, hey, I have, now I have paid traffic that can supplement if anything goes south. Yeah. Like also, you don't even own your own data. Some of these people who run on organic platforms, they're like, yeah, I get all my customers on Instagram. I'm like, dude, if your account gets banned tomorrow, That's what happened to me. like yeah. you, you lose money. If you're on Amazon and they cut your store, you don't have any money. Yeah. You need to own your own asset. That's why I was saying that, that the bat, the database is the yeah. value, right? And the relationship with it. So you got to get them off of social media onto your email list. Yeah, email list. I mean, they could even, like, I mean, not every social platform is going to go down, but at least get them on more, like TikTok, LinkedIn, you know, Instagram, Facebook, you know, even Snapchat. I know it's weird for some people, but, like, it's it's good to be on multiple sources. Um, I just, I want business owners to understand that, like, Hey, if anything went, were to go south, mm. it's going to cost you more mm -hmm. to not say yes than to say yes now. Like, it co it's costing you more not to run ads. This is what we have a conversation about being a hunter and a farmer, yeah. or both. Yeah. Because, you know, we're used to being hunters, or we're used to being farmers. But, you know, with this, with the, at least when I was doing direct mail, I know if I just do 5,000 pieces of mail, I know I'm going to have 50 people. 75 or 45, but now on average 50 people, every month I was doing a dinner summer. My burnout with that though was, there was something that happened in, in, uh, on Dateline, on Dateline uh, with Chris Hansen. He did a singing operation uh, on financial advisors and insurance agents doing dinner seminars. Because <laughs> some of these guys were ripping people off. Yeah. And so my, my seminar registration went like this. So my algorithm changed. It may not be an online algorithm, but yeah, I, I wasn't doing anything wrong. So I called the guy, so what do I do with my dinner summers? He goes, well, you need to double up. I said, yeah, but I said, does that mean I got to spend more? He goes, yeah, for the same people, so cutting my profitability. Versus now we can do, you know, hunting, but also do, do, some, do some farming, yeah. you know, get them, get them on a database. So, um, so that, my next question is, when, you are, when you're putting together a team, talk about team, talk about team, team creation. Because we've been working together with your team and seeing how guys, and these guys are sharp. These guys are smart and they're, they're, we're all communicating on, Slack, and so there's really no need for sometimes for long meetings because we we just get we just get what we need to get done in Slack, which which is awesome. But that's that's inefficiency. So when when you're building a team, 
how do you know when to hire somebody and how do you know when to fire somebody? Okay. So first rule is hire fast, fire fast. Okay. Second thing is a lot of people will get so attached to just getting the problem solved that they will just take the first couple interviews and hire somebody. Okay. Like Casey does all the hiring for us right now and he'll take 80 interviews a week just to hire one person because we're not going to settle for somebody who's just like, yeah, like I'm excited to get started. I can start today. Like I can do this and this and this. And then you throw them in and they're just a complete L, you know? Yeah. So it's not so, about just solving the problem. It's about finding the right person. Yeah. Problem. Cause we want people to be with us for years. Like we're trying to build a massive company here where it's like, Hey, like you're not just working here as like a contractor. Like don't think of it like that. Like this is a real business. Like we're building the event space out. We're doing all like I'm doing all the personal brand stuff. Like it's more that you're a part of. Mm -hmm. So I, I want people to be understand of that. Um, the other thing too, when hiring a team is like, you need to give them places to grow. So like if it's in KPI incentives or if it's in, you know, competitions within the team, like we have competitions within pods. So like a pod that's working with you, a pod that might work with someone else. Like we have pods to see who has the most revenue, who has the best ad results. Um, and we give them travel bonuses and stuff like that, where we'll give them an extra thousand bucks each and be like, hey, like you can go wherever you want to go, yeah. right? So like we incentivize them to kind of compete against each other in friendly competition to be better. And that's the environment piece. Like a lot of people will just hire somebody and they're just like, hey, here's your job, throw you in there. And it's just like, they're not satisfied. They're not happy. Yeah, they're getting paid, but like they're bored. And when people are bored, they do stupid things. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Like, it's, that's just, right. It, it's a bad mix. Yeah, and they get bad, into bad addictions and, and stuff like that gets them out of the business. Do, do you, okay, so question. Do you hire based on potential or do you hire based on experience? I would say a mix of both. Because if we hire on just, so experience is something where at least we don't have to train them as much. Mm -hmm. They have the right wit to have, because here's the thing, this is a side note, is the reason why you have to kind of hire more experience is because common sense is not common anymore, right? You could hire somebody who has a, like a lot of experience, but like they just don't have the common sense to try new things or they don't feel like they have the gateway to try new things within the company. They don't have that freedom. Like I would rather take somebody with 80% experience but has enough common sense to try new things than take somebody who's 100% experienced but like literally won't try anything outside of the book. So it's like that balance, you have to find that in them. And also like do role play on, on your interviews. Like say, hey, like if a client said this to you, what would you do? Or if a client was running this landing page, what would you change? Like that's what we do. We do role play on, on interviews. It's a three phase interview. So the first one's like, all right, what are your goals? Second one is tactical and third is compensation. So that's how we divvy up the interviews. And also interviewing for business owners out there who are making a lot of money, you have to understand that interviewing actually costs you a lot of money. Like. It is time, but it's time taken away from someone else doing something else operation-wise. Yeah. So, like, if he hops on 80 interviews, dude, that's a lot of money. We have to find the right person. Yeah, there's, no, we, there's no productivity yeah. in that. Because then the, those 80 hours, he's not, he's not doing anything else. Yeah, yeah. So. But, but then again, if you don't do it, yeah. then you can never grow and yeah. scale your team. So, yeah. So, so you wrote a book called Ads That Sell. So give us, break it down. What's the, what are ads that sell? Yeah, so I wrote that book um, actually during Thanksgiving weekend last year. Um, and the book is primarily about the four most important parts that I talk about my ads, which is the offers, your landing pages, your ads, and then the KPIs. And then surrounding that are, you know, I, I go through appointment setting scripts, sales tactics, like organic scripts, and like literally everything that I've ever learned over the last five and a half years is just in that book. Um, and that whole ecosystem that I'm able to build allows the ads to actually sell because some people only run ads, right? And they don't get a lot of results. It's because they don't have every other piece. Like you have a lot of organic, you do a lot of stuff, right? Collaboration events, all these things to where it's an ecosystem to where you're allowed to surround that prospect to buy. If you only run ads, they can find someone else to replace you. You have nowhere. They're not seeing you anywhere else. Okay. But like, if you're all around the internet and you have the omnipresence, you're bound to convert them. That's awesome that you say that because, you know, in, in the online space, you, you, and I know you've seen this, Jason, you've got the guys that are like, oh, you're, you're wasting money in ads. You just need to do organic. And then you got the guys that are like, oh no, you just need to do ads. Right. And you're, you're wasting time and yeah. organics too much time. Whereas what I'm hearing here, which I love is no, dude, there's a place for both of them. And you need to get strategic with how you use these pieces to not just attract, but to nurture yeah. and move people along the funnel to get them to where you want to be. Yeah. And that's the thing that 
you brought up a really good point where it's like people are telling you to do this thing and then do this thing. The brutal reality is that the people who are telling you to do that are telling you that because they want you to buy their shit. <laughs> so it's like, they're like, oh, you suck at organic, but like you didn't try it long enough or you're not good at ads. Well, you might not be terrible at it, but you can still optimize and we can refine. Like you're not atrocious at it. It's that they're just telling somebody that that's like the whole false promise niche. It's like, they're doing that because like, oh, you tried organic for six months. It didn't work. Yeah. You know what? Organic sucks. R do this instead. Yeah. And it's like, no, actually, you just got to tell the business owner, like, hey, like, you suck. But no one's going to say that. Yeah. You know, yeah. because then it, like, you know, some people can get mad by that. But I'd rather tell people the truth. Like, if my business is not doing well, tell me the truth on why it's not doing well. Don't just tell me, oh, yeah, don't do that. Do this instead. Uh, in terms of ad, what, what, what works better? A static ad image or a video letter? Or a video ad. I get this question all the time. Good. Um, so it really <laughs> changed. It, it hasn't changed. Okay. <laughs> so there's offers that we run where images crush more than video. There's offers where video is better than images. It's really coming down to the pattern interrupt, the copy, and the offer, and how you relay it. Like, um, like I have ads where I have a split screen, and like on one side I'm talking, and the other side is like all my Stripe notifications for low ticket. That's cool, right? Those do well. But then some of my images that just have literally a black background with white text, mm -hmm. launch your low ticket offer today for 27 bucks, those crush. It's just black background on Canva and white text, nothing else, no screenshots, yeah. just that. It, it really just depends on how people consume the content. Like different avatars consume content in different ways. So if you're able to find what works, then you just capitalize on it. Like if I see that a certain video is working, so what do you think I'm gonna do? I'm gonna take that video and say, how do we reverse engineer that five more times? Keep creative testing. If that image works with black backgrounds, what else am I going to do? All right, let's do a red one. Let's do a blue one. Let's do a green one. Like, that's the way that I look at creatives. I love it. I was going to ask, so, so then how much is split testing and testing various different combinations of things? How, how important is that? And do you have a specific process by which you do that? Yeah, so the process on how I do that is I will take, let's say I'm launching a new campaign. I have a bunch of interests. Because I want to see like what interest people come in from. And then within that interest is two to three creatives. Okay. Once I find the right interests, I will take those, duplicate, go to my second campaign, and then I'll test another three creatives. If they're still winners, I'll just keep going. And then, you know, obviously at a certain time, you have to go back up to the beginning and find a new set of interests that are not the originals. So it's a combination of audience testing and then also... Yeah, and also creative testing as well, yeah. When, when you're looking at our industry, for example, the financial services industry, you're looking at, because I know when I was filling out your form to application and work with the other, there's certain industries that you don't work with. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell me why? Why those certain industries, I, I, don't, I can't remember off the top yeah, of my head. Yeah, so work. like, we don't work with like CBD, like cannabis. Um, Cause they're regulated. Music. They're, yeah, they're, they're regulated, regulated and yeah. also like- Tobacco, alcohol, yeah, I can't Because those are tough to advertise for. If we ever try to advertise for them, they, they just get banned. Or maybe we get like 50 bucks a day off the ground and we try to go to 100 bucks a day and then it gets banned. Um, I said network marketing was one of them. Yeah, so network marketing is, it, it's a balance of what are you actually selling as the network marketing though. Got it. Because if, recruiting. Because the biggest thing that we've seen with network marketing is that if we can run the ads for it without saying the words like you and you are and a results claim, then it's compliant enough. But some people run network marketing and they're like, make a ton of money and like, you know, travel and all that, like those are going to get marked as MLM yeah. very, very quickly. It's the way that you frame it. But like, yeah, I mean, network marketing, we still run with most people who run that though, they say stuff in the ad. That's like, you're asking to get banned. <laughs> like you're just asking for can it. You, can you share us what those sentences are, those words? Um, like it's also the visual too. Like we've had a client in the past who was running a network marketing offer and like all of his ads were him in a pool with women. And yeah. I'm like, dude, like, like he's like, head. yeah, he's like, yo, dude, like run it. Like, I'm telling you, it's going to work. And we're like, dude, we're, we're not going to run this. It's going to get banned. And he's like, no, I told you what to do. Do it. I'm like, ah, I'm like, all right. So we, we run it. We run it. Yeah. That was a terrible client. We run it. It gets banned. He's like, oh, you guys suck. I'm like, bro, are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> we told you. I'm like, dude, we told you. Yeah. Um, the other thing too, with, with, with network marketing is if the video ads, like some network marketing ads that we've ran are just literally video and B-roll of events. And those have been compliant and fine. 
because the copy takes care of it. Like the reason why two people get banned running certain offers is because they're just not good at copy. They're not good at compliance. They don't understand like how you can still hook in an offer. Like for example, I have a new client who does dating. It's like a dating offer. Mm -hmm. And she's like, yeah, like I'm helping women get better dating profiles so that they can be more civil online dating. I'm like, no, that's why you're getting banned because you keep saying online dating, online dating. Oh, really? Dude, we just switched it to saying get swiped right more. And that was it. And now it runs. It's like the way that you say it relays the message. Did you the want to make that connection important. there, Milton? Just to, to swipe right in your profile? He's, he's, he's swiping around. I don't use apps, bro. I'm, 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 I'm 32 years old, but I'm an old school guy, bro. I like going up to women at Whole Foods. I like the melons. Or church. <laughs> or church. There you go. <laughs> Filipino churches. <laughs> no, just kidding, man. I'm Filipino. Kind of knows that. But, um, when, when you're looking at, when you're looking at um, an entrepreneur, just brand new starting out, he's got a good, you know, obviously you start a business because they have some form of reputation, some form of widget or expertise that allows them to business, whether plumbing or HVAC or, or chiropractic, right? And so what, what would be the first evolution of them going then online? What would you advise them? What would you counsel them? Um, oh geez. I mean, the biggest thing I look for with new businesses that have never ran ads is what is the, like, what is the easiest thing that, that you do in your business that makes you the most amount of money? And how do we take that and turn it into your offer? Like, what's the service that you offer that makes the most amount of money with the least amount of effort? And then we push that to the marketplace. Second piece is looking at, yeah. Second piece is looking at like your competitors. So going on Google search and searching plumbers near me, what offers are they running? Why do you think those work? What are they doing when they show up to the house? What do you think they're doing when they show up to the house? How do you pitch them when you show up to the house? Like, that's the sales process that I would dissect and just, because it's easier to look at it that way. If I know what drives you the most amount of money, least amount of results, then we're already one step ahead. But people might become some type of coach, right? And they're like, yeah, so I'm going to help you with your nutrition. I'm like, no, dude, that's too broad. Like, you need to be more specific. Like, it's just crazy how people get too excited, though, to get online. They start spending money, and they don't even know their own offer. They're just like, yeah, I'm a nutrition coach. It's like, okay, what do you do? Or like a mindset coach. I'm like, all right, like centralize that, though. Like be more specific. It's very important to do so because if you're not specific, your avatar now can make preconceived notions about what you sell before they even know what you sell. You know, sometimes social media is very deceiving because you see somebody with not a lot of followers, man, but they got a massive business. Or you got a massive followers, but... No business. Yeah. How do you, what's, what's your bullshit detector? Oh, geez. The bullshit detector. Huh. <laughs> um, I get you stumped. I got, I got Wojo stumped. Wojo's always got I an mean, answer dude, or something, man. I mean, the, bull, the bullshit thing that I do is like, if you, like, all right, this is the big thing that I've seen is people who get into the internet space. Okay. And this is my opinion. Okay. This yeah. is going to be a bold statement. Okay. Okay. If they get into the internet marketing world, like you like cars. Sure, yeah. sure. You like cars too. If you get to the internet marketing space, you start making money and you don't have like a nice or a supercar, I kind of just have this bullshit radar. If you don't have a supercar. I just don't believe it then. Okay. I just cool. can't do cool. it. I don't know. Like, I feel like if you're making more money that you're like in the space yeah. of direct response marketing yeah. that you would go do that for lifestyle marketing. Like, I, I just don't, I just can't see it. I don't know. But the more conservative financial people say, well, you know, listen, I'm, I'm happy with my Toyota Camry, you know, my, my K -K -K Kia. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but I'm like, hey, if you if you got into business and you start making money, then wouldn't it click that, like, you have more freedom and that you can afford things that are uh, enjoyable and, and like, yeah. exotic? Yeah. Like, wouldn't that click? I mean, that's why I was like, that's why I was stumped. Cause I'm like, the way that I look at it is if I was, if I even make more money, I'm going to have more cars and more stuff. Cause it's like, you're motivating yourself to keep pushing yourself. Sure. Like all the students that I've ever coached that have been at like five, 10 K a month. And they're like, Hey, Wojo, how do I grow more? I'm like, dude, your bills are not high. You have no reason to grow. So I'm like, dude, go get like an Alfa Romeo or a Maserati or something. And it'll motivate you. And they all just, and they all just make more money. And I'm like, I feel like that's a huge hack. That's what I did. Like when I was making 30K a month, I was like, I was sitting there for like maybe a year and a half. And then like I bought a Maserati and I made more money. And I was like, oh shit, that was easy. You, you know a fast way to increase your bills? Get married and have kids. There you go. That's, that's a great way. And, and you created a lot of good to society. Get married first, have kids. And by the way, I'm, I'm advertising, Roger, he's single. 
But uh, I don't know. His, <laughs> yeah, but I'm just saying, saying that he's not married. But uh, let's make sure. But he can economically provide and protect. Got to make sure you got the right one by your side. Um, uh, I want to ask you about advertising. So we got a lot on the marketing side of things. And the reason why I have you, the reason why I have Rudy behind, because if we're going to be spending money on ads, I don't know shit about meta ads and, and when I get ripped off. And, and I, got, I get solicitation because I have a Facebook page. I get solicitation from, from meta, Facebook, to do this in your ads, do this in your ads. Your team says, don't follow them because they, also the same counsel you said, they have a reason to get you to spend more money too. So I want to minimize my cost of defense. So what do I need to look out for when I'm advertising online? Um, yeah, biggest thing is those Facebook recommendations. Like, they're like, hey, turn your thing into an advantage audience and lower your cost per result. Like, dude, those are all AI-based suggestions. Like, yeah, dude, AI is cool, but, like, it's also not. So, like, they, they ruin the algo by you doing that. They just want you to spend more money because when you turn into an advantage plus audience, they're going to rack up your ad spend. They just want you to spend more money. It's basically when you take all, like... They, they, they are making this claim that if you have multiple assets running, mm -hmm. just turn them all into one and stack them. Oh, okay. And I'm like, yeah, that's good, but it, it makes you spend more for the same customer. Ah. And it takes longer to warm up. Yeah. Like certain, certain industries it's worked in, yeah. certain, but I just haven't seen enough for me to like full-fledged back. Is Boost Post a bad way to advertise? Oh, yeah, no. So that's what a lot of business owners do when yeah. they like go on their Facebook page, they see that Boost Post button, they say, oh, like, I just want visits on my profile. I just want messages. That is literally the biggest scam out there. It's just that Boost Post button. It is terrible. There's no conversions. There's no tracking. There's no pixel. There's nothing there for you to constitute the data behind what the money is is being backed by. How do you know it works, right? Outside yeah, getting... you have no clue. You just click that Boost Post button. You say 30 days, 20 bucks a day, and you just like pray and hope for the best. Is there any value behind having a quote-unquote viral video? I mean, yeah, for two reasons. One is is that you get more organic push. Mm -hmm. Second is that you get to retarget those video views with ads. Okay. So if you have a really good viral video, you can take that video and say, as long as it's congruent, though, like if the messaging in the video is not congruent to what you sell, yeah. then it's not congruent. But if it's a video that's congruent to like this event or whatever, then you would take that full video retarget all the video views of 50% or more, and then you would get, you know, some good ad results. And you're trying to sell an insurance policy. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. And when it comes to uh, um, the different, because you, you got your ad manager back there, right? You got your ad manager there. Uh, is it more expensive overall to advertise nationally? Because uh, we want to drive local local uh, people to our office or local, to our, uh, local people to our events. What would your counsel on that? Um... Honestly, just testing. Like, we run ads for our events, and we've just seen that running them locally gets a lower cost per, you know, Interesting. Ap application. Because it's less competition. It's less competition, and also that 100 bucks a day or 200 bucks a day that, like, we'll spend on some of our events, like, does really well. We'll get, like, 20 signups a day, and then from those, a certain amount of qualified, right? So it's it really comes down to the data and your avatar. Yes. Like, if you run them worldwide, you're going to have to spend more but you're going to have more scalability to where more leads will come in and the right sales team has to be in place to take on the leads. Yeah. When it's more local, it's like you're not going to be able to spend a crazy amount because your frequency is too high. Mm -hmm. So like frequency is how many times someone sees your ad. It might go to two or three, which be, it begins to get a little high once you hit that two to three frequency. So it's like, but when you run like the whole country, yeah. you're not going to run out of people to target. Got local, it. you can pretty quick. So, for example, one of the business I want to start is a cigar lounge, right? So your counsel to me here, here when I'm uh, hearing what you're saying, is I probably don't want to advertise the tobacco because you can't advertise liquor and tobacco online. But if I advertise an event at my space, like a business networking event or a workshop or something, that's the way you would go about. The way I do it, yeah. And like, they yeah, do cigar lounges. Like, it's hard to advertise for that. So I would like get a bigger spot and be able to host events there, and then you funnel people through that. Like, you could still, like, show the stuff in the video, like the B-roll, but you can't put it in the copy. You can't say Cigar Lounge. Like, it's gonna, it's it's a tough industry to market for. Um, so just, like, watch the verbiage, that's all. Yeah. So I, I, I want to, I'm not sure how much we can extend on this, but uh, my initial product, my initial engagement with you was getting hooks. So can we talk about hooks? So you talk about ad that sell. I want to talk about videos that, that get watched. Yeah. Or copy that's watched. So the biggest thing that sells is obviously controversy. It's like saying things that, you know, people aren't willing to say just to be able to get views and like have your own opinion on something. So like when people make videos now, it's like this ordeal of like, 
I'm just gonna give you a quick tip so you can sell more. I'm just gonna give you a quick tip to do this, but actually using like a fear angle actually works better. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, hey, like if you don't click this thing in Facebook, like they might shut you down tomorrow. That's a better hook. It scares the hell out of people, right? Um, another one is like, you know, the car you drive determines the girl you get. Like that's a controversial video. Um, it's just like the way that you say it in, in the beginning, like that first three seconds matters the most. And you also have to like make sure that whatever you're about to say after the hook though actually makes sense. Don't just like say a bunch of like rah rah and then afterwards you just like say something completely different and just like ruins the video and then you get a bunch of hate. But I like controversy because I feel like bad publicity is still good publicity. It's like if you're not thinking about me, then like you're thinking about somebody else. Yeah. Right? It's like it just depends. I mean, there's certain things that you shouldn't be saying and should be saying, but the whole the whole piece behind having a good hook is saying something that has two sides, right? That's why politics does well, right? Because there's always two sides. So it's like whenever you say something and you're picking a topic, just say, hey, do people hate this and do some people love it? Like pineapple on pizza. Like that's a good hook, even though it's not congruent to what we do, but like that's a very basic level, like chocolate ice cream or, or, or vanilla. You have yeah. to pick something with, with, with two sides. Yeah. Pineapple on my pizza for sure. That's, that's a Filipino me. But I, I, I got his, uh, I got Wojo's uh, six, his 60 uh, scripts oh, sick. here. Uh, um, here. So I want to go, I just want to go over a couple of these okay. just to get you, in, to just get you insight. Um, let's go, I'm just randomly here. Number five, this has been the most frustrated I've been in a setting, parentheses, niche action. Yeah, so you could say like, this is the most frustrated I've been since losing 5,000 on the phone or like something like that, where it's like, this is the most frustrated I've been since having three kids. This is the most frustrated I've been since my wife cheated on me. Oh. Like that would be a good hook. Yeah. So like, it's the way that you turn it into something that's like, yeah. you know. Matter of fact, I saw a billboard in Chicago for, for things called Four Seasons and the billboard says your wife is hot. No, no. <laughs> so, so you got you to chuckle out of you. So this because the air conditioner isn't working. Yeah. <laughs> Call us right now for a tune-up. Right? That that was, that was, that's great. That's, that's a pattern interrupt. Uh, stuff like that. Um, this one. Three little-known ways to achieve. And it's yeah. been hidden by the elites. Yeah, so like three little-known ways to pay no taxes, even if you're making a million dollars a year. Three little-known ways to get your first supercar with no money down. Um, three little-known ways to... Damn. Think of it. I would say three little known ways to like make 100K a month as a, as a beginning business owner is running events. Like that would be the secret. Dude, I've been telling so many people this and like no one listens to me. Like mm -hmm. obviously the people who run events that yeah. listen to me, but like. By the way, we're doing this at an event right now. <laughs> it is the yeah. hands down easiest way. To do events. To have a seven figure business is run events. Even if you don't have a brand or even if you're from scratch. I did a case study with this girl, Heather, that was one of my students three months ago. And she's like, oh, I don't know if I'm like going to be able to run an event. Like I'm not good on stage. I'm like, well, this is, you're going to be your practice run then. So we ran the same lander that I got and we just ran traffic to it. And she had about 35 business owners show up and she made 60 grand. And she's like, my biggest month was $8,000. And I'm like, yeah, you should have just, yeah, you, you listen to me. So it works. What was, what was the ad spent on that? What, uh, what would you say? Ad uh, I think she spent like a good nine grand, 10 grand. That's it? It's not bad though. Yeah. But dude, like 30, 30 something people who are all coaches who wanted to grow their business. And she helps them grow their business with a VSL. And I was like, all right, we'll just sh d go through all the VSL methodology at the event for two days and then sell them. Like, I just think that some people are scared to do events because they have a lot of like weird insecurities built up on like, oh, I don't think I could speak to people. I don't think I'm good with people or whatever. It's like, and then the, those are the same people who say, oh, uh, organic doesn't work. Exactly. Because yeah, that's more it, of a projection. Though. Yeah, it's all a projection. It's like you said, well, you suck. Yeah. It's like, dude, just get better. It's not hard. So our guys here event people to their offices twice a week, right? So, so uh, we talk about financial literacy. We talk about life insurance. We talk about generational wealth. We talk about entrepreneurship, capitalism, et cetera, et cetera. So can you create some hooks? for us to, if you were in their position, like for example, you started with us, what would be some hooks to get some initial people to start coming to the meetings to see what you have to offer? Um, first hook would be like a statistic. Like in 2024, 
X thing is going to happen to your like retirement account or X thing is going to happen to your job or like X amount of people are going to be laid off. So like a statistic. Um, second thing would be like if you're married, like if you're married, here's how to live tax free. Maybe Good. something like yeah, that. Yeah. And, pay for, and make sure your children go to uh, college without paying a dime of tax. There you go. That's yeah. a good one. Um, like what are, you got to think about too, like what are some of the pain points of the niche? Okay. Like, is it just around money or is it about generational wealth? So or here, here's it... the pain points of America today. More people are living paycheck to paycheck. Was the stat? 57% of people even making a hundred thousand a year are making, are living paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. Uh, 60% of people today, if they had a thousand dollar emergency, you don't know where they're going to come, come up with the money. Okay. Yeah. So that's like good statistics that I would like find from, um, whatever government agencies collect data on that, but like using that as the first line, like that statistic, that scares the hell out of people. Like a big statistic for my niche is 61% of businesses that make a million dollars a year or more break even or lose money. And people don't know that because they just think that someone went on Instagram and was like, oh, I do seven figures a year. And I'm like, bro, 61% of you are not making money or breaking even. That's, there you go. He just pierced the veil. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. saying things like that that get people like kind of like starstruck. So um, another thing to be like, you know, if you, if you're married and have two kids by July, your kids might not be able to eat. Like saying some like really like fear monger stuff to people will work because people won't get frustrated about their finances until they have trauma. Like, dude, they could live paycheck to paycheck, but what's the problem with that? It, 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 they can just kind of keep pushing. They can just kind of keep, yeah, because yeah. it's all complacency. It's not like a broken leg. They got to go see ER right away. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you have to put them in the fear monger state of like, hey, also you could run certain ads to certain industries. Like, hey, if you're an engineer or if you're a nurse or if you're a doctor or if you're this thing or you're a construction worker, you're probably going to lose your job by July yeah. or like something like that. Or that was like, actually what I was thinking about for our new funnel that we're building with these guys. So the front, we keep the back end the same, but the front end, we change who we're targeting and a little bit of the offer. Yeah. Because if you don't bring statistics, then they're like, I don't believe you. Got it. Then it's all just like a it's all just like a hook just to get them to watch, but then there's no action. The action is derived by emotion because people get emotional about their money. Got it. So a lot of people, for example, the average I just saw yesterday, the average Super Bowl ticket right now for nosebleeds is nine grand a ticket. Dude, that's nuts. No, what, what would y'all man? You making all this money? By the way, would you go? You making all this money? Would you go? Nine grand for nosebleeds? For two, bro. For two, I can get the deal for twenty grand. <laughs> I'd rather watch from my house though. I just bought a two thousand dollar TV that gets me better views. Like, Here's what, what I don't hell? get: all the stats I just shared with you, right? People living paycheck to paycheck. People don't have money for a thousand dollar emergency, and yet you got Super Bowl tickets for nine thousand dollars a pop, and people are buying them. You know, and if you buy if you buy two and you go out and you fly, and you go out and put yourself up in a hotel, you know, when you go to Super Bowl, everything's going to be premium price, parking, whatever. Oh, it's going to be nuts, nasty. But big reason why I don't go on vacation during vacation days i go vacation up when everything's off season that's when we go on vacation yeah, like my my biggest spending rule is, is my 3x rule which is like if you are thrown something to spend money on are you okay spending it three times so like if you're about to buy a watch some people go out and buy like this fifty thousand dollar watch i'm like are you okay spending 150 and then like you start to change a little, a little bit about, about it, it. Ooh. Somebody, well we just got a money rule huh yeah. financial literacy rule cool <laughs> Some rapper or somebody said it. They said if you can't buy it twice, you shouldn't buy it. Yeah. 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 Also, it just hurts your debt to income ratio, too. Like you're putting yourself in a deeper hole. It's like. Yeah. So, so you know, you know back, back to my point. All these things that people aren't doing in terms of finance. I mean, every generation right now, whether from baby boomers, X, millennials, Gen Z, every generation is behind on planning for retirement, saving for retirement. So, back to the hooks. How do I get people to watch my video? How do I get people to li watch my, uh, read my post? What would, some, what would be some hooks there to get people to? For just financial literacy? I would talk about average net worth of their age group. I think I read something about like the average net worth of a 30 year old is like a negative 11,000 or some shit like that oh, okay, yeah. because they're in student debt. Um, that's where I would like also a good hook that Dave Ramsey has used is the one where it's like, hey, if you, if, do you have 50 bucks? I can turn you into a millionaire if you have 50 bucks because you're like put 50 bucks in every single month into the S and P like that angle is really good. too. It's a slow way to do it. Yeah. Slow way. Yeah. But at least it gives them hope. I mean, it's true though. Like if it does yeah. the 8% 10 and you started eight years old, 
<laughs> yeah. You, I think it's like you start at 18, you go to 65. Yeah, yeah. But, like, I mean, that is a long-ass time. But, like, you know. A million bucks back by that time will yeah. be worth $400,000 based, based on inflation. Yeah. And, like, there's other ways that you could really portray it, too. It's like, um, like, what do millennials want? Like, yeah, they want a job, but, like, they also want freedom, to, flexibility. Want freedom. Yep. So it's like, hey, if you make, like, I would do a hook where it's like, hey, what do most people make as a millennial when they get out of school? Six, seven grand a month, maybe? Maybe I'm being bold. I mean, I don't know. Maybe four or five grand. If you make less than 6000 a month, you're poor. By the way, if you're watching this right now, you're millennial. What do you make coming out of college? Or for those of you, if you're a millennial, what do you make without a college? I buy with it. No college. No college. No college. All entrepreneurs, college? College, yeah. College. What would you, what'd you study? Business, but I was just... Yeah, no, I didn't really. Do Let me that. ask you this question: For everybody aspiring to go to college, how much of your business degree in education are you actually actively using today? Um, it wasn't even the business degree; it was the fact that, like, okay, so the biggest thing that I learned about being in college was like talking to women and partying. <laughs> I'm not. I'm being so for real. Like that made me so good at sales. That was it, dude. Like I, I just. I'm sorry, but like, I just had to say that. <laughs> Like, literally, the degree itself did nothing. But going to parties and being able to, like, have banter with women made me more money. It just, it just did. Uh, OJT. That's it, OJT. That's it, that's, I, I get that a lot from people who go to college these days, but uh, we're the, <laughs> on the job tra or hands-on training. Yeah, hands there you go, TCC. That's hands-on training. That's it. Um, uh, let's, I'm going to briefly talk about events. Like because, because that was very attractive for a lot of people to hear that they can go from scratch to $100,000 a month type of entrepreneur running events. Yeah. And they don't even have to have a big following or brand online. So what's the first steps to getting that set up? Um, first steps is you have to think about like what is the skill or the actual knowledge you're giving people, okay. right? So that's the first thing. Second thing is wrapping a good offer around it. Third thing is is, you know, actually finding the money to be able to host one. Like if you're... I mean, we're able to run 100, 125 people in a room at a Marriott. I'll probably spend six grand on the venue and then like another 10 in ads. So I probably get under in like 20. And then, you know, you might want to have like two salespeople, one salesperson with you mm -hmm. because you can't talk to everybody in the room and build rapport. At, at higher scale, like we have one salesperson for every 15 people in the room. So that's where you kind of want to be on that ratio to where, like, they know those 15 people. Um, and then, I mean, if you go to, like, my landing page, like, thescaleyouradsevents.com, you could just use my my landing page. It works. And you just fix the copy, and then you get people to sign up for free, and then you qualify them on the back end. They fill in an RSVP form. You keep them in the CRM. Yep. Like, that's the way that we've done it. But the, the, the biggest thing I want people to understand is that the events work better because you don't have to deal with all the objections of sales calls. Like, you're not sitting there on the phone. Like, most business owners take 10 sales calls a day, maybe two close. One tells you next week, right? If you took the, what, what is it, 22 days that you're usually taking sales calls and you had the other eight days just for events, you would make more money. Yeah. Like, we're running events every single week, February 10th. So we go 22 weeks in a row. And, like, dude, we are going to stack so much money during those 22 weeks because I don't have to spend all the money on sales call ads. Like, I'm just going to do it all in events. Well, just creating his own economy, baby. That's what this is about. You're creating his own economy. Um, when, you, when you're looking at these ads, why, we use the same similar CRM system. Why do you like CRMs? Why do you like the system? We were using Go High Level. What, 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 what does that work for you so well? Um, I think it's just, it's has good integrations, even through the API. Um, second is that it's very user friendly. Third is it also hosts your funnels and landing pages. So once they fill out a certain form that's dedicated to the platform, they stay within that same funnel and you can get texts and emails. Like ClickFunnels doesn't do that. ClickFunnels, you got to use an outside source to send SMS and email. Like, you just got a funnel. Yeah. You don't have a backup. And do with GHL, you can make phone calls from it. Yeah. Click funnels, you can't. Yeah. Like GHL wins every day of the week. Yeah. It's just that when you tell somebody to go change, yeah. most people don't like change. So they're like, oh, I like click funnels. Like they just like, I'm like, all right, fine, whatever. But the the whole premise of a CRM is to make sure that not just you like it, but your team likes it. And it actually brings you results. Like people think that sh like the software is going to change their life. Yeah. Like you could still run click funnels and make a ton of money and build a really good business. 
But at the same time, it's not really about the software. It's about how you use it that dictates how actually performance-based it is. Yeah, what you put in there and how you use it. Yeah, what you put in is what you get out. One thing that I love about it, you know, we're, we're launching our version here this Thursday, uh, is being able to make phone calls and record the phone calls. Or, and people don't have to use, you know, their cell phone. They can use a system of, yeah. of what provided them. And then if they don't like, if the phone call didn't go right, and it's like, wait a minute, I thought it was a close. Send me the link to that call. Let me listen to it right now. Like you're able to review your game tape, so improves the sales the sales uh, skills of, of your guys that much faster. Right. So, um, I got one final question. I don't know if you uh, have any other question. What any follow ups to this? Yeah, I mean, this has been a lot of fun. Which yeah. I learned a ton, man, dude. I'm just taking notes. I'm doing some of these hooks. We're creating some math. We're gonna have some fun with this. Sure, stats. Absolutely, I stats. Absolutely, man. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about the events because uh, you mentioned something that I thought was pretty profound stack my focus on events versus sales call lead acquisition to sales call um i can understand that because the environment melts away a lot of the objections because people are getting to know you right so if we were going to put on some events i mean we got your landing page that we could swipe a little bit mm -hmm. right and i'm sure you guys will help us with that yeah, of course um what leeway time are you putting from you know, so you're marketing the event to the event. What I time do, frame in between? I do two months because I want them to sign up and then also join my Instagram and follow me for two months and be like kind of pre -framed. So you're nurturing them all the way through mm -hmm. until the event as well. Yeah, because the people who come to the event that are two, three weeks out, they don't have enough time to research you if they don't know you and they still have objections. And also, like, the content that I post, like, yeah, I say bold stuff on camera. And, like, I post a lot of, like, my favorite quote, which is, like, everyone's an entrepreneur until the invoice comes. And people get pre-framed about that yeah. before the event. It's really funny. It works. Um, like, dude, there's things here that, like, that we've done in our events that could definitely help you guys out. Like, like the whole, I don't know if you do this, but do you do, like, group chats when people sign up? When they come in here? No, like, group chats. Like, do you put them in a group chat before they come to the event? We we only we already have our own yeah individual group not overall but actually we do have one overall yeah but... no I'm talking like I message three four people in it oh no good one if you put them in a client experience not just that but you're like building rapport with them before they even show up to where they don't even think that like you're trying to sell them you're just like being a friend so every single person who signs up for an event they get automatically thrown into an iMessage group chat and then periodically over the next two months they're getting. YouTube videos for me. They're getting all this stuff, content, like, hey, what's your biggest concern about your ads right now? We're just asking them questions. Yeah. Is that outside of your CRM or is that just on your phone? It's it's outside of the CRM. Yeah. Yeah. That's your manual labor. You're not you're not automating. So that. we have three setters who control all the group chats and then they just have a script in Google Docs that they follow. The other thing, I don't know if you do this, is like as soon as they register here, you hand them a gift card. Uh, okay. the, the reciprocity angle crushes, dude. Like, we've seen the conversion rate go up like at least 30% when we give gift cards. When they show up, we're like, hey, lunch is on us. Here's like a Visa gift card. Bro, I'm telling you right now, you do that, you, you'll you make twice as much money. Yeah. I love like, it. Because you just sell them on the back end. Yeah. And then also, when they walk in, we have a thing where they can take a picture. Mm. But the whole angle of them taking the picture is, hey, here's day one with us. Like, here's your day one picture with us. To where you're pre-framing that they're going to stay here forever. Wow, that's right. The, the angles are really good, yeah. That's great. Massive, massive. And uh, as, as I wrap up, Matt Wojo, I appreciate you coming out here, man. Uh, coming out to uh, San Antonio from Florida. Yeah. Um, a lot of guys are watch, guys and guys are watching our channel. It's a faith, finance, entrepreneurship type channel. Give us a case. Give us your case for entrepreneurship. A lot of people still are stuck in this job mentality. People are still stuck in the self-employed mentality. Entrepreneurship is really about going out there, solving problems, taking that risk, and doing what you've been doing. Mm -hmm. So if you can sell us your narrative on why you should, yeah. you should work for yourself. Yeah, biggest thing is, like, if you want to make more money and you want to provide more for your family, you have to be willing to bet on yourself. Like, I just, you could work a job all you want, but, like, no one's going to save you. Like, you have to save yourself at the end of the day. Like, if the world collapses, you have to rely on yourself. You might as well get more comfortable with yourself and, and rely more on yourself. Um... The other side of coin is like, if I can do it, a lot of people can do it. Like, I'm not saying everyone can do it, but like, you know, I wasn't the smartest person. I just stuck really in, into the diligence part and consistency and put myself in the right rooms. Like a lot of people are afraid to pay to be in the room. Like you have to pay to be in the room, regardless of what you think.
Um, <laughs> like you have to pay to be in the room and you pay to be in the right rooms. And when you're in the right rooms, people will respect you and you, you become a part of this like sphere of influence. And that intrinsically motivates you even more and you're able to get more done and you're able to make more money and you have more, you know, influence. Um, the other thing is, is I just would not be satisfied having somebody else hover over me and telling me when I can get paid or not get paid or maybe I could lose my income. Mm -hmm. Like that scares the hell out of me. Like if someone came to me one day and was like, hey, like you're going to work here, but like we could fire you. And you're just sitting there every day and you're just like, damn, like my job could be gone. Is today the day that I lose my apartment and my car and like my girlfriend leaves me because I can't provide anymore, like whatever happens, you know? So also it's about legacy for me, like make more money and just like, hopefully my name's around the advertising niche for a while. Like I see a lot of bigger names out there who are crushing it with like their books and like, you know, like Hermosi and all these guys, like they're going to be in the advertising niche for years to come. So it's like, that's kind of my big play too. But it also comes down to like self-belief. Like if you don't believe in yourself, you have to be open to change. So like a lot of people don't want to start a business because they're not open to change because you have to reprogram the mind completely. And like escape the matrix. Yeah. For them to <laughs> welcome change is yeah. scary. And also they're afraid of losing their family and their friends if they, if they decide to change. Yeah. Like it's important to really think about believing new things and be open to those new beliefs. I asked this tongue in cheek because I'm thinking about the great staff you got on your team. They hear that coming from you on this podcast, right? Like, well, shit, man, well, maybe I just need to create my own business. So how do you create an entrepreneurial environment where people want to stay with you? You know, even though, they, because for example, me, there's a lot of things that PHP does for me that I don't have to do completely on my own is if I was a fully fledged hundred percent on my own. Like PHP takes care about 30, 40% of all the headaches I would deal with compliance, marketing, the business, the C-suite, having to hire a C-suite. I don't have to worry about that. I stay focused on what I, what I do best, which is recruit, build, train, develop people. How would you create that entrepreneurial environment for Bojo Media? Yeah, I mean, we always welcome all our team members in and realize that, you know, hey, like you have a base pay here, but you can make more as incentives. You can make more by providing more value to the company. We also provide them with training. Like we send them to events, you know, wherever they want to go. And like they have to, they have to obviously send a proposal first. But like we go through and we're like, hey, like, should we send the team here? Also, the team comes to my events and they get to hang out with me. And it's a cool like culture lift because yeah. like they see me on camera all the time. And they're like, all right, like, who is Jason? Like, is he actually like cool in person? And then they hang out with me and we take them out to dinner. We do like cool activities, Airbnb experiences, like all that stuff, you know, like comedy show or just going out for drinks. Like that's more important to me than just trying to like save the money and make them all feel like they're not a part of something bigger. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm always, le I'm always open to them doing what they want to do within the business too. Yeah. Like some of them want to sell clients on certain things that we do provide, but like they don't stick to the book. Like they're excited about sending a client to something because it's beneficial for them. Like they're excited about helping people because they know where I'm headed and like the things that I'm trying to push and like, it's important to them. So it's cool. That's awesome, man. Well, what has been your biggest takeaway if you're watching this when you listen to Jason Wojo? How do you pronounce your last name again? Wojo Howitz. <laughs> Wojo Howitz. I just follow his pronunciation. So that being said, uh, what's your biggest takeaway? Uh, what are some of the things that you're going to implement? And uh, we're going to have Jason's links all in the comment section, excuse me, in the description section below. And uh, I want you to make sure you reach out to Jason here. We've been working together with him and uh, we're looking forward to doing so. And there's a lot of things we got to learn. I think one of the biggest takeaways for me, we got to do better hooks and stats. And I think we got to do more events, bro. I think the whole cigar is wealth and whiskey. I think I'm thinking about that too small. I think I need it instead of an evening, I need to make that two, three day event. Hello. So that being said, there guys, there's some takeaways and hold me accountable. I'm just not a asker. -er. Is that, a, is that, is that a word? <laughs> I'm just going to ask her the interviewer. I'm not an asker of questions. I'm actually an implementer and uh, you're going to get a lot out of your life by implementing things that you learned from Jason here too, as well. So make sure you connect with him. That being said, if you haven't done so already, make sure you like subscribe, share this with your friends. Biggest, please put your biggest takeaway in the comment section below. We have Jason Milton, Rudy here from the escape the matrix event. In San Antonio, Texas, I'm your money smart guy. And until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. God bless you guys. Bye-bye.